Yeah, I think you just try to. Sh yeah, that's there. Oh, that's oh no, 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 but you can't share it. Try to share it. Okay, so. Oh, right. No, the other one. This one. And then share pre uploaded slides. Click it again. Click on it again. There it is. Okay. Thank you, DKG. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so it's in a new, just not in a new plug. Yeah, he showed me how to. You go boom, admin, this, and then you get the refresh there. I'm not sure why that's done. I'm very curious because I think I did it wrong. I didn't know how to do it. Here? Yeah. Admin? Yeah. Let's start from the main. You, you get this, you get this one, and then you get that one. Thought I did it. Thank you. Yeah. No. Thanks, DKG. Got your shirt off. Uh, okay. Welcome, everybody. Um, Hi, we're going to get started. Hi, can we please get started? Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, first, Welcome to SAC. If you're not thinking you're at SAC, you should probably run somewhere else. This is the note well. Uh, if you have any concerns about legalities and IPRs and trademarks and things that involve lawyers, um, be aware that if you're not fully up to date, maybe leave the room and read things. Uh, otherwise, you can stay and uh, follow these rules. Um, living the life of the um, IETF Code of Conduct, um, a reminder that um, we treat each other with respect and courtesy and we have impersonal uh, discussions um, and we treat each other with respect. Um, one note I want to add here, sometimes uh, some of the um, working group chairs accidentally say, you all know this already, so this doesn't really apply to you, but you know, treat each other nicely. Um, please avoid doing that, because if there is a problem in your group, that person feel extremely disenfranchised. Um, I heard this once this week. Um, so please take extra care of your chair not to do that. Um, meeting tips. Uh, I think everybody at this point has uh, that has experience with the Meet Echo. Um, please join the queue if you have questions. Please try to mute all the audio video if you're local and you don't need it. Um, for the remote participants, please try to use a, a headset if you can. It really improves the audio feed in the room. And Rick Saltz already has a question. <laughs> <laughs> So, Rich, it's wonderful that you are in Meet Echo. Some of you may be wondering why there's not enough chairs to sit in. The way it works is uh, the secretary accounts how many folks logged in at the last meeting and sizes the room appropriately. So if you have not yet scanned the QR code, please do so, so we have more seating next time. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so um, the agenda is pretty short this time. Um, we'll do some agenda bashing, then we do some uh, reporting from the working groups, as we always do, and then we have a presentation on a survey of newer cryptography, um, a talk where we uh, hopefully share some new concepts uh, and bring everybody up to speed on, on some new exciting cryptography things. Um, and then we have to open mic. So with that said, does anyone want to bash the agenda, have some... New items, all good. Our regular helping out slide, um, we always want people to get more involved. If you're more involved, then um, you can move up the ladder, which means you're even busier during the week. That's really cool. Uh, <laughs> you might, might be able to become a chair or an AD or an ITF chair, um, but you can also start very slowly with a uh, document shepherd. Um, it only takes a few minutes, um, or even better, if you do errata of the um, the area where you are really an expert, it, it might take you 10 minutes to resolve an errata, and that would be really helpful for everyone. 
um, it might also be that um, you're ending up writing a new draft and become an RFC author if we find a problem um, when we're doing the erratas. Um, and of course, uh, really uh, attend all the buffs where you can. This is where a new work gets launched into the IETF, and that's where you really have a say as well. Um, Chris? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, I guess, share an anecdote. Sorry, the, um, the mic is not working. I think. Oh, uh, OK. OK, I'm just, um, just wanted to share an anecdote, um, uh, in, I guess, from my time asking people if they'd be interested in sharing. Um, I often get uh, a lot of comments like, uh, you know, this, this group is too big and too important for me to consider doing so. Um, now's not the right time. Um, uh, and I, I don't really know how to deal with that other than to really encourage them that, you know, you're, you're oftentimes paired as a new chair with more senior chairs who know what they're doing, have, uh, can, can help you, you know, figure out process things, resolve disputes, work on your consensus building, you know, uh, muscles, whatever. Um, but if anyone has like suggestions or I guess um, advice for how to, you know, um, respond to that sort of feedback, it would be helpful because I, I, there, there, are, there are a lot of like good potential candidates for chairs, um, but oftentimes I feel like they're, you know, uh, put off by the, the, you know, perceived difficulty of doing so. And it's really not a hard job um, with like few exceptions. So I... <laughs> so, so Chris, th thank you for, for mentioning that. I think a, a couple of pieces of commentary. I mean, first, you're exactly right. Not all working groups are the same. A absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that's something that when the, the SEC ADs are kind of making choices, this is in fact kind of something that we consider. One of the things, and you already mentioned it, that we have largely been largely being committed to and I think in a in a 70 30 kind of way is to do the one one plus one pairing which is we have an experienced chair and then someone brand new or kind of relatively new so if you feel like you are in the relatively new kind of category it is unlikely I think the track record says looking back that we would never put two brand new chairs to run a very contentious uh, group if nothing else for our own self-preservation uh, <laughs> because we will be kind of called in so we, we're always looking to pair someone with kind of some more experience. So, we, so we'd never put you in that kind of situation. And also, it's important to kind of remember, if you have come to us and said, I might be interested in kind of chairing in your and you're looking kind of what opportunities are kind of available, you know, just because you, you come to us and, you know, there isn't something immediate, we won't, it's not necessarily won't think of you in the future. And you can also say, if we come to you and say, hey, what about this opportunity? And you say, no, that doesn't preclude you from ever being kind of consulted again, kind of from us. We realize it's a, it's a point in time uh, consideration. So thank you, Chris, for kind of mentioning that. And I think the last thing we would mention, a more structural thing that's happening across the ITF, the LLC has been running these training sessions to help working group chairs that uh, the benefit from facilitation kind of experience, conflict management kind of experience, or also aspiring chairs that have not run a working group yet, they can get that onboarding and having participated in some of those sessions. It's both hard skills of here's some practical advice of what's happened, but it's also it turns out to be a great kind of cadre of folks also that are like you that that you really kind of talk about what's really happened in working groups. And so it's very kind of practical feedback like that as well. So thank you for kind of bringing that up. Yeah, I guess, and oh, Paul, were you going to say something? Um, uh, you had mentioned that it's useful to, I guess, kind of, or I think I heard you say it's useful to kind of know kind of what's roughly going on in your working group and be able to dig in technically. Um, that's obviously a helpful thing, but I don't think it's always required. So for example, I, I share mask in the transport area do not consider myself a transport person. I know like how bits go from A to B, generally speaking, but like there are other experts in the room and my, my role there was to basically facilitate discussions, help move things along, not to be like a, a networking transport expert. So um, I think that also applies to security area. Like obviously it's good to, for someone to know what like, uh, like, you know, like encryption is in general. Um, but you don't need to be like a cryptographer to be like, you know, the security working group. Uh, right. Chair. And in fact, on top of that, if you are an implementer, you, you in, uh, maybe even have like a conflict of interest very quickly, right? When you're, when you're involved. So having actually a chair that is, you know, knowledgeable in general uh, is, is also a really good property to have. So, yeah, sure. so don't be afraid if you're not like a, the most well-known expert of that, this working group or, or protocol. Uh, so. Rich. For real this time, uh, on the erratas, at the last time you, oh, okay, I'm too short. 
Yeah, Rich Saul's Akamai. Uh, okay, you threw me off my train of thought. Last time you at the SAG, you presented a slide about the dire state of our of errata in the working group, and we put out or I made a spreadsheet out of the list Roman had, and there's about more than a quarter of the of the errata got comments. And I wondered if you had done anything with them. No. So, Guessing no. <laughs> no, 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 no. We we have gone through a bunch of them, and and, and uh, a number of them did get resolved. But um, we might have to um, look back and actually see if we missed You've anything. Gone through the errata or through the comments on the spreadsheet? That's what I was asking. So we, so we have worked on some of the errata. What what got done that we dropped the ball on is there was a spreadsheet that annotated what we could have done. In other words, it, it did what you're asking on number three right. at the last IETF, and it was noticed a couple times on the mailing list, and yes. now you know again, so thanks. <laughs> so thank you for everyone that contributed, commenting to that. Sorry we dropped the ball on that. Very clear. And thanks for the reminder. Um, Sean Turner, uh, I didn't get up to talk about errata, but I will. Uh, apologies, it's the TLS working group. We're probably like the main offender. We do need to kind of go you through You are, in fact, the main We are, in fact. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll still, again, I think it's after 70 years. 70-something. Yeah. So we'll, um, we'll try to get together with the chairs to figure out some way we can try to start to plow through those. Um, but I did get up to talk about, you know, chairing stuff. In actual fact, sometimes when you're a working group chair, it's actually good that you don't know anything about a particular topic. Because I've been, a, I was a chair of a, you know, really hot topic working group, uh, WebRTC at the time. And all they wanted to do was somebody that had nothing to do with this and had nothing to do with the IPR. And we were going to make a decision. And I think it worked because I didn't care if we were going to make a decision. So <laughs> it's like, all right, today's the day we're going to make this home. Suddenly, the, the issue went away. And then everybody proceeded, and then we could all Zoom when the COVID came around. So it was great. So, <laughs> so thanks. That's it. Uh, so working group changes since last IETF. Um, so we had two buffs. Um, we had the dull buff and the spice buff. Um, as the responsible AD, do you want to sure. do summaries of these? Uh, I would feel bad making Sean get up for the belt. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I, I think we had, uh, well, we had two boffs with fairly conclusive results on both parts, conclusive in a different way. So Dalt, this was the second, uh, the second boff we had. It was working group forming. We walked out of the first uh, boff with consensus that we were interested in doing kind of something around the topic, but we did not have consensus on what that specifically would look like. A good bit of the feedback was around the uh, coming out of the first boff was the, the discussion was too narrow. We walked in the second boff uh, with a dramatically expanded charter kind of in my assessment. And after a conversation during the boff, there were specific ways in which that much more general charter could have been polished. But we largely felt that in broad strokes, it definitely captured the spirit of what of what the ITF was going to work on. There was consensus around that, again, barring those, I believe, six particular items. And what's going to happen next is the charter, I believe, has had five of those six PRs already there. I need to go to the mailing list to ask for a call for consensus, whether those PRs address the feedback that came out of the box. So that's the next step. So watch that mailing list. With uh, with Spice, uh, we are a little less uh, less down the, the the maturation kind of path. What was very clear coming out of the out of that conversation is that there's en en energy and interest around doing something around the three party the three party identity kind of model. That there's interest in doing that in a Cbor representation, and then we got into a conversation on how much scope should be should be covered, and we have a we have a couple couple options that came out of that off conversation. So what we're going to do is take that to the mailing list with uh, capturing that there's enthusiasm to work here. This is an area the IETF should be operating in, but we got to really refine how much how much scope to grab. Coming into this, coming into that BOF, I was listening kind of very hard because we have a lot of interest in identity and a lot of existing identity working groups to hear whether we felt like we had overlap, whether we needed to make sure that we connected one thing or another. But uh, walking out of that out of that, Bob, I largely heard that there is definitely something narrow here that may certainly have linkages with other other existing kind of working groups, but there's definitely new scope to cover here, and we got to refine that, and we're going to do that on the mailing list, so please join us on the Spice mailing list. 
if there's other things I forgot relative to that buff, folks should uh, should come up. Uh, it's worth mentioning. I should kind of thank the success of both of those buffs rested on the prep and the the prep and the facilitation first of the proponents, but the buff chairs. Uh, so with Dalt, that was Sean and Osa. Thank you so much for for that leadership. And for Spice, it was Pam and Hannes uh, who led us there. And so this is another class of leadership kind of opportunity in the ITF leading leading buffs. Uh, I'll, I'll keep talking since we're on, on the slide. Uh, since the last time we met, uh, we chartered the Key Trans Working Group, which is going to be meeting tomorrow for the very first time. And there is new ground to cover in OpenPGP, MLS, and Lake, and they are in some version of rechartering. Either the charters I think are ready, or they are already with the tele uh, for a future ISG review on a on a tele chat. Okay. Uh, two things. Two things to mention. We're going to talk a little bit about working group uh, working group uh, summaries in a second. But first, as you stare at that, I would like to. If you attended the plenary and you heard about the ITF is going to be reorganizing by ITF 119, the art area. So there are certain working groups right now that are run by SEC, but they are in other areas, uh, either kind of in art. Yeah, I think, yeah, they're all in art. And they are going to be coming home, so to speak, in SEC. So we will, there's no change in what the work will be doing and, you know, where we are with documents or the rest of it administratively, they will just appear in a new bucket. So we're going to officially say that Skim, Tigris, and Yuda are now going to be SEC area, SEC area working groups when all of the, all of the, the, the transitions happen right before we land in Brisbane. The other thing we wanted to clarify with working group uh, summaries, we have historically done a couple of things in the past. First, we ran a very long mic line and said, hey, 26, and then we make those addition 29 chairs. You want to come up the mic to tell us something. Uh, that is, a, is an interesting facilitation exercise with lower utility, we thought. Then it turned into drop something on the mailing list and folks started dropping all sorts of things on the mail list to include things like the working group kind of met. We did not feel like that was also a great kind of use of time. So I think we, what we are migrating towards, since we got a lot of questions from chairs, or maybe you read those summaries or wondering what happened, the guidance we are roughly putting out is if you had something significant happening in your working group that you think would be valuable to message up to the broader kind of SAG group, please feel free to write a report. Please put it on, on the mailing list. And, you know, we can also ha have the conversation at the mic line. We're going to open the mic line in, in a second for you to also orally kind of do that. But we are effectively saying if you're going to give us a pro forma summary of what happened, basically the working group kind of met, things are moving along, we're kind of on schedule. We don't we don't really kind of need that. If you if you want to summarize the details or do new and notable, you can do that in the mailing list or you could also do that at the mic line. We have a couple folks queuing up. Paul Hoffman, you are first. Um, as somebody who consumes all of those messages, because I have to write up trip reports for IETF. Uh, I'm, by the way, Paul Hoffman from ICANN. Paul Hoffman from ICANN. Um, I have to write trip reports. This is a, the, even the people sending the sort of pro forma ones, super, super good, because I don't go to all of the meetings. So I know you're not as interested in the pro forma ones. Some of us are consuming them and they're saving our butts like, oh, I should have gone. And then I'm going to go back and look. Okay. Thanks for that feedback. So what we would say to the working group kind of chairs, again, we would ask you to exercise your kind of judgment if there's something you think is notable worth saying, and then we'll treat that the absence of that is, again, things are in flight the way they should be. Richard. Hey, Richard Barnes, uh, Ojai co-chair. Uh, I uh, just wanted to uh, give a small update here that I think we are, Ojai is getting about to the end of its work and is probably going to discuss shutting down here shortly. Um, I can, been meaning to mention that's the ADs and I see my co-chair is not here to disagree. So, so that's the update. Uh, thanks Richard and excellent background. Anyone else? Richard's coming back. Oh, he's... <laughs> it's a lot less busy in the lobby there, I see. Yeah. I tried to get the video working so we could have the elevators going up and down, but I couldn't figure out how. <laughs> For folks that don't recognize that or might be remote, uh, that is a background shot of what the hotel lobby looks like, and Richard is, in fact, remote, to explain the laughing to those that are remote. If anyone wants to, to get a drink afterward, then let me know. 
<laughs> okay, uh, so just like we just explained the process, the mic line is open if, if any of the working group chairs or, or any really contributors to the working groups want to come up and say something into the mic relative to what transpired that they think would be useful to the, to the larger group here. <laughs> Hi, Russ Housley. I want to talk for a second about lamps because something unusual happened there. Last Friday, we um, were, were given a heads up a pre uh, publication of an attack against CMS where um, if, you use, if the originator used AES CCM or AES GCM, that the attacker could. Uh, convert it to a message that used AES CBC and um, uh, in this way create a completely bogus message. But if they were able to uh, see what the, the recipient did with it, um, they were able to recover one ciphertext block. And so um, we were able to agree on an approach to fixing it on Wednesday. So less than a week. I thought that was pretty awesome. And to confirm, I'm sending the document back to the working group, right? Yes, you are. <laughs> Others want to come up to the mic? Mention something relative to the working group? Doesn't have to be a zero day. <laughs> <laughs> the bar is lower, in fact. Okay, in that you case, can raise the bar that high. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in that case, we'll just go to the next slide and just remind folks that there's all sorts of SEC related things, not in the SEC area. This is our laundry list that is probably 95% right uh, about some of the things that, that are happening. If folks want to remind us kind of with corrections, topics we have missed, or if, if folks want to mention, uh, make commentary about those working groups or community activities, please do come up to the mic. All right, in that case, uh, we're going to keep going. Uh, we'd like to highlight uh, chair changes. We talked about it kind of in the open. So we'd like to first kind of thank uh, for all those chairs that are that have been leading our working groups and stepping out. So thanking Kathleen for her time in SEC Dispatch, in suit to Russ and David, and in ACE, thanking Daniel. Uh, we are very appreciative to, uh, to the new chairs that have stepped in in SEC Dispatch, DKG, uh, in key trans meeting for the first time is Ori and Siobhan, and Tim has stepped in in ACE. So really kind of thank you for those that have served. Thank you for your willingness to serve all of you. We like to track for visibility the new working group mailing list and pro forma. We, this is a, our pro forma kind of slide to make sure we don't forget about it. We did not create any non working group mailing lists. For those that are newer kind of to this process, what does this practically mean? Very often, if we're going to start new work and we think it's not going to happen inside a particular working group, it's going to go to a BOF or go to a working group, or we need to assess that. We, we take that community of discussion and we, we spin up a new mailing list. It's, it's a relatively light, lightweight process. And we watch that mailing list and we let that community grow and decide what to do as that community does. So if you are sitting on some idea that you think needs broader or, and focused kind of discussion, certainly start it on a mailing list like SAG and SEC Dispatch. And then what we will probably do is observe that discussion. And if it feels like it's growing and big enough and needs to get a focus, we'll spin up and create a mailing list. And you can do that by just emailing us. I'll just mention, I don't know if this was in SEC or in ART, but we did have uh, the uh, whimsy, whimsy mailing list. And then we had a whimsy bot for workload identity. So perfect. That's say what, more. That's going on. Yeah. Can you say a little more? Um, yeah, we met on... Uh, was it Tuesday? Yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday. And uh, we had, uh, it was a non-working group forming BOF, uh, had a number of uh, good presentations, but at the end of the thing, the kind of uh, result was that we need to do a little bit more scoping work to kind of uh, bring, bring a, a more refined set of uh, items to uh, kind of get to a working group. 
So, Joe, would it be fair that one of the discussions we had during the bail during the during the BOF was that we're not really sure exactly what area in which this may land, and it is a possibility that sure. this could have SEC overlap or even end up in SEC. So, this would should be a broad of interest to the group. Yes. Great. Thanks. Uh, so at this point, we're getting to the point in, in, the, in the slides where this is the accountability phase, just letting you know some of the things that we are working on, maybe more narrowly on behalf of the community. So you, you know kind of what's going on from past discussions. This is our AD sponsor queue or drafts that we've been asked to sponsor and we are deliberating on a, how to exactly play it. I'll just kind of pause here. If there are any questions, comments? We generally, as a as an overall kind of commentary, I, I don't see anyone kind of coming up. Generally, if you're going to ask us to AD kind of sponsor something, we would like it to go to SEC Dispatch so we can get the broader discussion, uh, broader broader discussion and perspective started there. So if you're wondering how does one start this process, you can always come talk to to Paul and me. But SEC Dispatch is always a good place to start. Next slide. Uh, we have talked about errata. Uh, what I would say is from the numbers, uh, we are in place. Uh, we're up 15. We closed kind of 16. Uh, there are 40, Rich, you said, in the spreadsheet, give or take, that we can probably... Something like that. Sure. Okay. So, th so there, there is a whole bunch in there that have been commented on, and we need, and we need to take action on. Get you know, kind of apologies. Thank you for the work. Apologies for that. That we dropped the ball and, and we, we didn't action that. And we were initially kind of talking about who the heavy hitters are. Uh, TLS, as I recollect, was in the 70s, so we could use a little bit of tension there. I say lamps, but in the in the errata system, for those that know, uh, there are there's the PKX working group and other predecessors. I'm lumping it all with lamps because that's where the expertise is around all the classes of technology. And then in cascading order, we have OAuth, Acme, and EMU, and those are in the, in the single digits. So I would say if TLS, lamps, and OAuth is I, I, those are all at least 20 to 30. If those working groups can look at that, thank you. Please do that. And if you've already put it in the spreadsheet, you you know you don't need to go any further. Okay. Uh, administrative things, and these are places where you can find, uh, find, uh, get a quick summary and kind of find what we're working on or what directorates are working on. So first, I'll put, I'll point out in the middle. If you're ever curious where your document is, uh, there are two dashboard pages where you can find out exactly where in the process of Paul and my fingers uh, they kind of exactly exactly are. You can also find out you hear this word telechat. This is a, a quick, uh, quick shorthand for what's called the formal meeting in which the IESG does reviews uh, for something that's lost to me, at least in history, they are called telechats. Uh, and if you want to figure out agenda wise, that's that, that's where you are in terms of agenda. And then think that it's always good to have eyes check check in on this periodically is the second from the top of bullet there, which is called common sec AD discuss issues. And this is some, this is a list of things that Paul and I and our predecessor ADs have commonly dropped discusses on. And to think of it in another way, these are instances where, boy, it'd be really great if you held this checklist before you're trying to publish your document that you checked that this did not come up. So something like, hey, uh, did, do you have URLs in your uh, kind of in your document? Did you put some security considerations of some kind about all the bad ways in which URLs could be abused? And there are, and there are common uh, a number of other things there. All the other areas also uh, run this to help facilitate less less surprise late late stage in the process. And this is also a place where the security director, which looks at the documents even a little bit earlier, we try to capture things that the security director says repeatedly and commonly in an easy accessible place. Uh, speaking of the security directorate, uh, honestly, the, the load that Paul and I have is directly related to the extremely hard work and the dedication of the team that you see directed there. Every single document that proceeds to ITF last call and is published in the ITF has got, in the last three months has gone to the fingers of those individuals you named there. The security directorate is a key resource that we have to make sure that all the documents published in the IETF have the quality from the security perspective that, that they would want, that we would want as an, as an organization. So all of these folks provided reviews for the things that, that flew through the document queue process. And we are profoundly grateful and kind of thankful for their contribution to, to the review of those documents. So really thank you to the security directorate and thank you Tiro for managing the assignment of those documents each and every week. 
So with that, that is the formal administrative kind of part of the of, of the of the SAG time. We have one talk, and then we're going to have open mic. So we invite Chris and Ori. Are you doing slides? Uh, if you want, we can we can, we can do next slide. We do get two at one mic. I'm standing back here waiting in case I'm needed. <laughs> so you, I want to like provide a little bit of, of kind of context. So we asked uh, Ori and Chris to do this talk. We called it new cryptography to the ITF. This is not new cryptography. It should say new cryptography we are seeing emerge in IETF working groups. And so what we were observing was this pattern. We were charting working groups that were using new crypto kind of mechanisms of CFRG and others. And it did not feel like everyone was up to date for what some of those other, what, what the research groups were publishing and what we were putting in some of the new working groups. And so we worked backwards. Uh, you know, Ori and Chris worked backwards. They found those working groups with some of that fancier crypto that it wasn't just straight symmetric crypto or kind of straight signing with kind of a public key and wanted to showcase to to the group uh, exactly kind of what was happening for awareness if you're working in those working groups this may not be new but not everyone's working in all those working groups so we appreciate this tutorial style talk that, that you're doing yeah sure uh we have 45 minutes for this i doubt this is going to last 45 minutes um uh although if there's discussion at the end that's kind of interesting um <clears throat> so the title is new cryptography at the ietf however um uh, i've chosen to up level this a little bit and uh, i'm actually going to try to not talk about a tremendous amount of cryptography more talk about the stuff the features that the cryptography enables which and, is i think as protocol designers and table stakes was no formulas right uh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a surprise no it, there are actually is, no form is, there I, are no formulas i know it okay. is not a surprise <laughs> um Right. So um, uh, it should go without saying that cryptography is mostly a tool for solving certain problems. Uh, more often than not, it's like a very, very small part of a solution. So uh, I've listed a number of examples here that I'll, we'll, I'll walk through in a bit more detail later on. So uh, using public key encryption to like encrypt things in TLS and MLS and oblivious HTTP, using a PAKE to end-to-end -to -end encrypt like stuff that's uh, like a, a, in a particular, uh, you know, uh, chat messaging application or whatever, um, using blind signatures and privacy pass in uh, private access tokens that Apple deployed, um, using signatures with this uh, selective disclosure property and verifiable credentials. Um, all of these different high level things have like interesting cryptography that underneath them that is, as uh, Roman was saying, it's not like your run of the mill symmetric encryption, hash function, signatures, whatever. Um, and uh, our goal here is to uh, just kind of briefly, very briefly, um, survey some of the things um, that we think are uh, potentially interesting to people building protocols, designing protocols, um, uh, but mostly to, um, uh, uh, I guess, try to encourage people to, um, you know, not be too intimidated by these things. Um, uh, I know there's this like this uh, idea that people should not roll their own cryptography, which is, I guess, generally good practice. Um, but you shouldn't be afraid of like using cryptography if, it, if it's like the right tool for the job. Um, there are some caveats I'm going to include at the end to, to follow up on that. Um, so with that said, uh, the first thing I'm going to start off with is public key encryption, which may seem like a run of the mill thing, but um, uh, the CFRG recently standard specified um, a, uh, uh, a, a, a more general, flexible, reusable construction for public key encryption called hybrid public key encryption or HPKE. Um, as is in the name, the purpose of this particular tool is to encrypt things under a public key. Um, uh, and so the basic idea is, as shown here in this particular picture, you have a sender who wants to send a message to a receiver uh, over some, you know, a non-secure channels that an attacker would get access to. The sender has a message that it inputs along with the recipient public key, um, invokes encrypt or whatever the or whatever the, it's in the specification. Uh, sends the ciphertext or whatever uh, pops out the other end to the receiver on the other side who invokes the opposite operation with the private key. Um, the syntax and the way you would use this uh, should be fairly straightforward. Um, and this simple construction uh, is already found in a number of different uh, ongoing standards, um, like encrypted client hello, wherein we take a public key that we fetch from DNS and use it to encrypt a client hello that clients will then send to servers. Um, it's used in MLS to encrypt uh, uh, all sorts of things that like, are actually sent to the group. It's used in OHTTP or Oblivious HTTP and ODO to encrypt 
HTTP messages, binary encoded HTTP messages, or binary encoded DNS messages. It's also included in DAP, the distributed aggregation protocol to encrypt um, values that are sent up to the uh, participants in the multi-party computation setting. So um, it's, uh, it, it, I mean, the, the construction itself was motivated by, you know, these protocols like existing, like we needed public key encryption for TLS encrypted client hosts mm -hmm. specifically. And we could have just like plucked out, you know, some uh, standard elliptic curve based thing that was, you know, uh, has been implemented uh, and, you know, had a standard somewhere. I don't remember exactly where, but, um, you know, uh, we, we thought like, why not add yet another standard or whatever um, as the, mm -hmm. the good comment goes. Um, uh, but I, 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 and, you know, jokes aside, I think the, the, the construction that came out of this um, is immensely more practical than, you know, past public key encryption schemes, in particular because it's very easy to slide in post quantum constructions. So we've already deployed post quantum versions of Oblivious HTTP. It would be very easy to deploy post quantum versions of a TLS encrypted client holo. Um, uh, it'd be easy to implement. Deploy is separate because there are you know, certain considerations about how big things get on the wire. And TLS and whether or not uh, they'll get through in various network conditions. But putting that aside, um, uh, this this tool is generally pretty useful. So if you find yourself in need of public key encryption, reach for this. Um, uh, and and using it, you might have to consider asking yourself uh, a number of questions. Uh, for example, like is the public key that I'm encrypting to the right one? Is the the this like public key is it the valid or the correct key for this intended recipient? Um, if you're using it in a setting such as, you know, Oblivious HTTP or Oblivious Do, am I using the same public key that everyone else is using such that I get the desired privacy properties that I want from this thing? Uh, you might also have to answer in a system that uses public key encryption how you actually distribute it. With the ITF, we like to punt on the key distribution problem because key management is hard and um, uh, uh, it's generally application and deployment specific, but um, uh, so you, I mean, you may have to, in, in deploying this particular type of thing, uh, think about this rather than just like bake in your public key into a binary. Obviously, that's not the, the best solution. Um, so, uh, you know, it public key encryption immensely useful. It is a very small part of a larger solution to a problem. Um, like for encrypted client host specifically, because I guess I'm, I'm perhaps closest to that one. Um, it is the tiniest uh, piece of the. The, the overall complicated protocol. Um, and uh, if you if you want more information, there is a specification for RFC 9180 that was developed in CFRG. Um, and there are some other um, drafts that are floating around to uh, extend or add new versions or uh, variants of HPKE, you know, with post-quantum support, different AADs and blah, blah, blah stuff. Um, uh, details that as protocol designers, you should not really have to worry about. Um, okay. Uh, the next one uh, is a PAKE. Um, it, this may not be new, um, but uh, I've, I've thrown it on here because uh, the CFRG has recently um, is kind of finishing up uh, specifying two different types of PAKEs, um, one of which uh, is what we call a symmetric PAKE, where both client and server share the same view of password and use that password to authenticate and establish a secure channel. Um, and then an augmented or asymmetric PAKE, um, I forget which is the preferred term, um, but the general idea is like one party has the password, the other party does not. Um, uh, and this is, uh, as the, the purpose uh, line suggests, pretty useful if you want to use that password to establish an authenticated uh, secure or shared secret that you can use to, for example, bootstrap a secure session um, to like talk to one another. Um, but you could also use it for lots of other purposes. Like you could use it to pair devices. This is, um, this is used all over the industry. Uh, the thread and matter standard for IoT uh, connectivity uses a PAKE, um, SPAKE2 plus in particular, uh, for uh, device pairing. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, you can use it for end-to-end -end encrypted backup. Uh, that's what WhatsApp uses uh, using a various uh, a version of OPAKE. Um, and you can, uh, as the sort of name of the protocol implies, you can use it for uh, you know establishing a secure channel. Um, uh, in fact, there are like variants of TLS that use PAIC to authenticate the other endpoint and you know establish that particular shared secret. Um, there is not yet one for TLS 1.3, but um, maybe if someone wanted to do that, they could. Um, the uh, as before with public key encryption, um, you know uh, 
the, the actual cryptography is a small piece. There's lots of other bigger questions you need to answer. Um, the first one I would encourage you to you know, ask yourself is whether or not like not using passwords would be a better answer for your problem. Um, uh, so for example, like in the web space, you might consider like using a pick to like authenticate to parties, but maybe with the industry momentum behind things like web authentic and public key authentication based on like digital signatures, maybe that might be a better solution. Um, you might also need to consider whether or not, um, in the case of the asymmetric pakes, whether both parties need to see the password or somehow need to enforce policies on the password. Um, a property of the asymmetric pake, again, is that not both parties do not necessarily see the password. So if I'm logging into a server, the server just knows that I possess the password, but doesn't necessarily learn what it is. Uh, and other like you know password like authentication environment or arrangements, the server would just be given the password and it would check to see like, is this Alice's password, yes or no? Um, and maybe is Alice's password greater than eight characters with you know exclamation points and special characters and whatever. Um, but uh, you know, such such uh, policies, if you want to enforce them, kind of go out the window with certain types of pakes. Um, and so you know, I guess you need to ask yourself whether or not that's like something that you uh, is important for your particular deployment. Um, you should also ask yourself, uh, you know, what is the threat model here? And in particular, um, you know, is the attacker who is attempting to uh, either masquerade as one endpoint or, you know, uh, uh, establish an authenticated connection uh, as if it like uh, guessed correctly, guessed the password of uh, one of the parties is able to brute force login attempts um, because passwords being low entropy, presumably um, that might be an issue. Um, some PAKE protocols are not you know, resistant to this particular type of things while well, others are. Um, and so uh, choosing the right type of fake for your problem depends on whether or not this particular threat is something you need to concern yourself with. Um, so there are lots of picks out there as well, which is unfortunate um, because I guess as an application developer, I imagine it's probably quite confusing to choose, you know, which one you want to use. Um, but this is precisely why the CFRG decided to uh, try to embark upon, you know, choosing two, uh, you know, uh, recommended pakes for the, the the different environments or the different you know deployment uh, assumptions. One is asymmetric pace C pace, the other one is uh, the asymmetric or augmented pake O pake. Um, and I point people to the drafts if they are interested in learning more. Um, I should oh sorry I should have also mentioned um, uh, I, mean, I should, probably should have included links to like you know, the, the thread and matter stuff and the WhatsApp stuff, there are white papers and like standards that exist that describe how these higher level systems, you know, embed pakes for their particular solution. Um, that, uh, for, I guess, from a protocol design perspective, that's actually the more interesting piece. These drafts are long and boring. Um, uh, uh, I wrote the opaque one, so I know how boring <laughs> that one is. Uh, uh, so yeah, I, I, don't, I don't encourage you to start there. Um, Okay, another uh, pretty interesting tool is um, uh, a protocol for I'm going to call private aggregation. Um, and the, the idea is here is like, let's say you want to compute a function, um, an aggregate function, say the, the sum of, you know, a set of input numbers um, in a setting where there's a bunch of like, call them clients sending you integers or values to, over which to compute this input aggregate. Um, uh, a private aggregation function will allow you to compute that, that aggregate output without the sort of the participants in the protocol ever learning the inputs. So if it's the, the sum aggregate, this particular type of protocol allows you to uh, only compute the aggregate output without revealing the individual values that contribute to it. Um, this uh, is immensely useful in privacy preserving measurement applications. Um, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, so useful that there is a, um, a uh, I did not list it here, but there's a working group, uh, PPM specifically chartered to d design, specify, and ultimately deliver um, this, this protocol for doing so called the distributed aggregation protocol um, for private aggregation or more generally privacy preserving measurement. Um, and this has found, uh, a this is tremendously valuable, as I say, um, uh, there are a ton of services that offer this type of thing. So um, divvy up. Um, is a service specifically spun up by ISRG, the people behind Let's Encrypt, for offering this type of service. Um, the I think it kind of first hit mainstream and po gained popularity in COVID days when um, Apple and Google joined forces with some others to uh, use this type of system for uh, computing analytics for uh, their exposure notification service. Um, uh, and that was particularly impressive given the timeline at which they rolled that out. Um, uh, 
so hats off to them. Um, uh, so uh, as as always, I think the you know the the PPM is actually kind of interesting, or the the DAP protocol is kind of interesting in particular because it's like a, it's a huge layer of uh, like protocols and cryptography that um, if you're going to implement the whole system from scratch, you have to read and consume and you know kind of absorb quite a lot. Um, uh, so uh, you don't need to for the purpose of this, you don't need to understand any of the underlying cryptography. That's really not interesting. Um, uh, even the DAP protocol itself, that's not super interesting from a, but from a, like a user's perspective, there's a lot of interesting like threat model and deployment questions you may want to answer. Um, so the, perhaps the most obvious one for uh, a protocol that depends on like non-collusion for its security and privacy goals are how do you actually ensure non-collusion is, you know, uh, enforced? Um, Typically, what we find is that in practice, like these are business arrangements between different entities that are running these aggregator services in the cloud. That is, in the case of DAP, the two things running these services. Um, uh, um, but maybe there are other ways that you that make sense for your particular deployment model. Um, uh, you might also ask yourself, like, how the aggregate function like actually the offers privacy in a particular way. So for example, if you were, you know, using DAP to compute the, uh, you know, the, the, the average salary of all people living in New York City and who live in the Upper East Side, who have French Bulldogs, who go to the ITF, who run a lot, um, have uh, like blonde hair, blue eyes, and are like five foot 11 inches tall, that is a pretty dumb, like the application of DAP because there's probably not many people that fit that particular, um, that particular bill. So, um, uh, you, you know, the, the tool itself is only useful insofar as you use it correctly and using, uh, or, or like tr trying to reason how to use it, uh, correctly is perhaps the, the, the more interesting piece. Um, and that kind of folds into the last consideration here, which is like, how are the aggregation parameters configured and, and then distributed to people who are going to participate in this client? Um, uh, like what is the minimum batch size, uh, for, um, the, the aggregate such that, uh, or the batch size being like, how many inputs go into the aggregate before you actually reveal the aggregate output? If the batch size is one, you're like not really hiding anything because you're just basically revealing the input. Um, so uh, as an example, um, and uh, then you have uh, the distribution problem, which is very similar to the public key distribution problem in HPKE. Um, you need to know how to like kind of in an authenticated and secure way distribute that. Um, uh, such that clients are using the right thing. Um, and I don't know why this reference is cut off, but this is a reference to the PPM DAP draft that describes the high-level protocol. Um, it is still a work in progress. Uh, could probably use a lot more work in, with respect to applicability, um, how you actually use it safely and correctly. Um, and it does have pointers to the underlying cryptography if you're interested. But again, um, uh, well, I didn't write that draft, so I'm not going to call it boring. But um, you could start with the... Uh, the top level one, and you should be fine. Uh, okay. Um, uh, next up is uh, I'm going to call private authorization. I'm going to call this uh, particular protocol private authorization. Um, so this is a uh, a type of protocol or a type of tool wherein you might want to authorize clients to do a particular thing without revealing, um, as the, the words exactly say, and I'm reading them out loud, without revealing unique client information. So um, this specifically is Privacy Pass, if people have heard of it. Um, and the, the basic idea is like, I want to, you know, uh, in, ensure that, you know, um, uh, I want to, uh, as, a, as a holder of a resource or someone who might want to do, do some sort of authorization check, I might want to ask my clients or people who are trying to use this resource to prove to me that they um, uh, have, have done something in the past. Like they've gone through some attestation check, they've solved some CAPTCHA, whatever it happens to be. And they prove to me that they do this with the, uh, a very like a single bit effectively, which is a like a cryptographic value that um, uh, we call a token, but it's effectively just a bit that we can check to see whether or not the bit is correct. Um, in Privacy Pass, the protocol for like you know creating that bit in a way that makes sense and uh, you know relying parties can actually check. Um, uh, and this is uh, um, has a number of different applications. Like the, the initial idea for this came from Cloudflare many, many moons ago, where the idea was to use this as a signal for, um, uh, I've already solved the CAPTCHA in the past. Please go away. Don't ask me again. Um, also has applications sort of in the new you know, deployment of Privacy Pass, which is called Private Access Tokens, driven by Apple. Um, but you could also imagine using this outside of the web. Um, uh, 
for example, as a civil attack prevention mechanism for the distributed aggregation protocol, or really any protocol that like needs to uh, enforce some sort of authorization check or authorization policy on a resource. Um, uh, uh, as as before, the you know the protocol bits completely uninteresting. Um, the uh, cryptography very uninteresting. Um, how you actually use this thing in a way that makes sense for your deployment and threat model is the more interesting question. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the most important question often emerges uh, from uh, discussions about privacy pass are like, what is the signal or what does the bit actually mean? And that is like, you know, in, in, in the initial capture case, it was this client has solved the captcha. In the private access tokens case, it's this user has an iPhone or whatever. Um, and uh, figuring out what is the signal that you're actually testing to and, you know, implementing that and deploying that in a meaningful way um, is non-trivial, I'll say. Um, and people have concerns about, uh, reasonable concerns about, you know, what it means to do this sort of uh, uh, attestation on the web. Um, and uh, that's a whole other can of worms that I'm not going to open right now. I may have just opened it. Um, uh, Another concern, uh, consideration, which is kind of uh, an internal detail, but so maybe probably in hindsight should not have included this, but um, depending on how you use and hold privacy pass, um, there may be various attacks that are problematic. So for example, you can use privacy pass in a way where um, uh, as a client, I can fetch a bunch of, or I can go through a process of obtaining a bunch of tokens that I can spend later on um, in, in a way that doesn't like violate my privacy, but this, this this property, in fact, can be abused because I can have me and all my friends uh, get a bunch of tokens, give them to my other friend who then has like an, a huge collection of tokens and uses them for abusing the service, um, uh, which may or may not be a problem depending on your particular use case. Um, uh, in any case, the architecture draft for uh, the privacy pass uh, sort of core documents describes, uh, you know, how you use this thing. Um, you know, what are various deployment considerations that you should take into account? And uh, as always has pointers to the underlying protocol bits and the cryptography, if you're interested in it. Um, and that cryptography is again uh, specified in the CFRG, um, uh, but is, uh, yeah, kind of the boring piece. And I think with that, I'll turn it over to Ori. Thanks. Um, just, you know, one comment on the previous piece, like sometimes people use this term unlinkability regarding that. So if you read the, the privacy past architecture, you'll see that they have a really clever uh, and concise definition of unlinkability, which is really good. And if you hear your working group talking about that property, um, make sure that they're using it, like either that they're aware of how privacy pass uses it, or if they're using it, you know, in, in the same way, or they should be just make sure that they're aligned when they can be. That's what I'm trying to say. All right. Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, selective disclosure. Uh, it's another property that you might want to embed, um, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, and the, you know, the key idea here is usually when you protect information, you end up having to reveal all of the information you protect. So in a public key uh, signature system, you might have a subject identifier uh, and an attribute like a name with a value like Alice, an attribute like a date of birth with some date. Uh, and in a selective disclosure scheme uh, with this three party model, you have the ability to, uh, the issuer has the ability to secure that information and give it to a holder. And with this selective disclosure property, that holder could reveal only part of that with integrity of protection to a verifier. So for example, if the verifier doesn't need to know my name, but they just need to check my date of birth, I can reveal just the information that's necessary to the verifier. And that's really useful when you're trying to build um, any support for data minimization into your protocol. Um, which is an important property of like applying least privilege and sort of like reducing the information that you share when you have the ability to do that. Next slide. Oh, sorry. Just me. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> great power comes great responsibility. Uh, the button is vanished. Uh -oh. is well, this is basically selective disclosure, so we're kind of done here. Um, <laughs> Well, I'll elevate that. You can pass uh, control to me if you want, and then I can try. And use there's it. nothing more to disclose. Thanks, Richard. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so, you know, where does this show up today? Uh, so you see examples of this in the digital driver's license rollouts. 
uh, proof of vaccinations, you know, perhaps in redacted trade documents. I think we've all seen redaction in documents before. It's that fun blacked out part of the long document that you're trying to read. And you might wonder, like, is what's behind that redacted information? And could someone sort of change what's behind that redacted information in some way in the future? And so selective disclosure schemes give you confidence around that the information wasn't changed. You can prove uh, that the, when you just decide to reveal that information in the future that you didn't change it. Um, and the specific examples of this that you see within IETF are you know, within the OAuth working group, the selective disclosure, JSON web token, uh, W3C uses that same technology to provide you know, selective disclosure on top of their data model. Um, there's various different uh, organizations building on top of verifiable credentials that take slightly different approaches to selective disclosure. And indeed, you can build this property in a number of different ways. You can use uh, salted hashes, you can use Merkle trees, uh, you can use zero knowledge uh, selective disclosure schemes like the BBS work that's happening in CFRG. Um, yeah, let's take questions, light questions. Philip, Philip, please. Yeah, when you, uh, Phil Hambaker. Yeah, when you said at the first at start, uh, cryptography, you know, don't roll your own. Yeah. I think that we got to retire that because it's become ambiguous and people are misinterpreting it. What we meant back in the 70s was don't write DES, you know, don't try and do AES. And now when you start to look at what applying cryptography to a design means, um, it, to many people, it looks very much like rolling your own. And I think that we're giving, we're telling people something which isn't what we mean. The message doesn't have clarity. So what I suggest instead is we say, design of cryptographic protocols is a team sport. Don't do it alone mm -hmm. and get reviews and be prepared to have people destroy your little darlings because <laughs> you know that that because the thing is that if you don't try to roll your own and fail and be told that you failed you're never going to learn and so it just struck me that that that's telling people the wrong thing so it's not it's a team sport is what i've got to be saying yeah i like that um i think you know, what you said about the, you know, the primitives, like be careful as you construct that primitive, but also be careful how you take totally safe primitives and put them together, you know? So it's, it's great advice. Um, I think I've said everything on this slide. Cool. So, um, Chris, this is, this is our wrap up slide. I only had to do do so right? I've got it. Uh, the takeaway is, you know, cryptography is a tool, uh, and, you know, be careful. Uh, we kind of just said that, um, you want to be especially uh, cautious about just like, you know, going reading a paper and you implement it yourself and you put it out there, you know, be, be cautious around that. I think also it's okay to sort of say in your implementation, you know, this is experimental. I based it on this. Don't use it, you know, for production. Like when you're working on something brand new, communicate clearly around the state of maturity that it's in and provide citations. And if it has gotten review, give people uh, who want to dig deeper um, the right tools to like get connected to the rest of the work. And perhaps they may read your work and read something else and then come back to you and tell you to fix parts of it. Yaron. Yaron Chef, uh, sorry, it's only somewhat related to your very nice presentation and uh, spilling into the open mic anyway, I, I'm wondering about the uh, pipeline that we're using for new cryptography. And I'll give one example from the recent, uh, from today's CFLG meeting, where we're talking about BBS, does uh, um, a number of very good use cases uh, for for these signatures, um, and and then there's a timeline. This publication, this publication, this publication, and this internet draft. So I'm a little bit worried about CFLG publishing stuff 
that should have gone through normal uh, peer-reviewed um, publication, uh, academic publication, which we usually do, uh, I think that we should actually maintain this pipeline of first you go through crypto or Eurocrypt or CCS, and only then you go into CFRG. And then when, when we get to ITF, we know that we have a nicely vetted uh, crypto. Do you have specific examples that, uh, of, of specifications or written in CFRG that did not follow that process? So that's the notion, that's the impression I got from uh, the work on BBS. I may, may have got it wrong. Uh, yeah, I, I can't speak to BBS. Um, so, I mean, that's not new crypto, really, even when it came to BBS. There's been sort of a progression of uh, review of that work. Like, in particular, the, the comment around you know, removing the last parameter and still proving the uh, security properties in, from Eurocrypt like last year. So that's an example of, you know, it's still going through the academic review process and they're actually changing the CFRG draft as that's happening and they're, they're kind of happening together. Are you saying that this is a property you don't like seeing or you want to see more of that? It's a little bit shaky. So very new, overly new cryptography, maybe. So just want to point out two things. First, if you'd like to say something, please use the Meet Echo tool to put yourself in the mic. We have two other people in there. And kind of secondly, thank you for that feedback, Aaron. You might also want to bring that to the CFRG chairs if you feel uncomfortable. If you want to, want to continue kind of talking about that, we here in the ITF are consumers of this kind of tech and have little leverage on kind of how CFRG adopts documents. If I may really quick, Justin. Um, so yeah, my experience is that... Um, like we, and CFRG generally demands some sort of like security analysis to be done for everything that's specified in that particular group. And more often than not, the thing that's actually analyzed differs like just a little bit from the thing that's actually written down in the specification. It is really hard to get those two like bit for bit equal. Um, uh, but we do like, I think in good faith, try to ensure that the delta between the, stand, the, the spec and the actual like security analysis, the thing that the construction that was proved in the paper is uh, sound and like not broken. Um, we may like fail in doing so, but I think the, the processes that are in place in the CFRG particularly ensure that um, with very high probability, the thing that was in the spec matches the thing that was analyzed and that you know we're kind of delegating uh, to the, the, the community, the academic community to vet those things. Um, that is not to say that bugs cannot be introduced, um, you know, but I, you know, process wise, I think we're doing everything right. Justin Richer, uh, I want to tell a little bit of a story. When uh, Annabelle and I were, uh, were working on HTTP message signatures, we put in as an example, just an example, a non-normative example, what we thought was an obvious application of the, spe of the spec that we were writing. And then a cryptographer uh, got a hold of it and said, what on earth are you defining? Oh, is he here? He's in the room. <laughs> oh, <laughs> didn't see you over there. He got a hold of it and said, what on earth are you thinking? This is crazy. And um, the basic, what basically happened, uh, to summarize a lot of back and forth conversation, is that Annabelle and I had assumed certain properties of the cryptographic primitives that we were applying that weren't actually there. And so we came to the wrong conclusion in applying those. Now, this turned out to not actually be part of the protocol, but it was a sharp edge that we didn't know that was there until we were told. And so now the, the spec, which is, in, uh, which is in RFC editor queue now, has lots of glaring warning signs about, hey, if you are coming to this same obvious conclusion that we came to, stop. It doesn't work that way. And so um, I wanted to say one, thank you. Um, and two, highly, highly encouraged, like, yeah, <laughs> you cannot just plug in and everything will be fine. Like, and we, it's like, we weren't even doing fancy crypto. Like it was, it was just a signature. It, it was that's just like <laughs> a signature. How hard could it be? Yeah, it turns out real hard. And um, 
And so this is encouragement to the set community as a whole to, you know, to echo what, uh, what Phil said earlier, it, do get more people involved, do get this out in front of more people, because even the examples that you're giving might uncover some things that what you're assuming about how you're applying the primitives in that context, those primitives might not have the properties that you think that they, that they actually do. Yeah, thanks Just, for that. I'm going to jump in. Justin, thank you for bringing to the mic and thanks for putting this on the slides. Really, on behalf of the folks I can't name that have done formal academic kind of analysis of our protocols, whether in TLS, MLS, OA, NAP, uh, we were just talking about kind of web signatures, a tremendous thank you for finding the sharp edges and making sure that what went out is so much kind of better. Uh, this, in my opinion, has up leveled the game of what the ITF kind of publishes. And in some circles, you know, folks are now demanding this as kind of table stakes, a conversation we have kind of long had about what that bar should be. So kind of thank you for, for that feedback and giving that to us here in the ITF. Stephen. All right, Stephen, so uh, a comment on that, I guess we have a, you know, a usable formal methods research group now. So if you have problems that need formal analysis, you know, it's not a kind of a shop you can go to and get service, but. Uh, In fact, I have asked whether we can create a, a panel, review panel like that. Yeah, so I think that, you know, part of the reason is the tools are a bit too hard to use still. So that's why the research group exists. But I, what I got up to say here is I think a lot of these new kind of schemes, VDAPs and so on, um, th there's a problem with them is how too easily explicable they are. Um, in some cases. So I think Richard, for example, was trying to explain VDAFs in the, in the chat. And that's, there's parts of that that are easy enough to explain, but parts that are not. And <laughs> I don't think we can kind of expect uh, internet drafts or RFCs that we produce to include that explanation. But I think we could really use it because a bunch of these schemes are kind of hard to explain to a random ITF person or a random developer. And they kind of need to be before people will use them well, I think. so. I think I'm just appealing to people who are proposing these schemes to, as well as writing the draft and producing your proof, find some way to make it explainable to a random developer and then things will go much better. Yeah, I strongly agree. I, I, that's kind of why I tried to up-level this and not mention like VDAF or blind RSA or whatever. Um, I think VDAF is a particularly problematic case because like it's the first time the ITF has ever done some sort of MPC and I don't think we know in general how to explain that to people. Um, uh, so yes, totally agree. Um, uh, I don't like know concretely what that looks like, um, but uh, yeah, I, I, some, something to discuss, I guess, maybe in CFRG. Like, how do we how do we like write specifications in a way such that you know they're more approachable to the to the protocol designer who might not know what a what a, a secret share is or whatever. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm, so I'm not sure it needs to be in the specification, but it needs to be somewhere around and, and available. So, you know, it could be a slide deck or something, right? But, um, but I think, I think when somebody is proposing a new scheme, I mean, they're clearly, you know, they're busy enough already for, with, with the kind of security analysis and with uh, writing internet drafts and dealing with people assholes kind of making comments. Um, <laughs> but one of the th other things I do think we need there is, yeah, some way of explaining it to like just a random ITF -er who doesn't come to the security area meetings, or if you had one that would work for like, you know third year computer science students, I'd be quite happy to reuse your slides. That kind of audience though, I think is, is we, we are have to have a way of explaining. We are happy to entertain a, an ITF 119 sack slot, uh, speaking slot. For, I'm not saying for you, I'm speaking to the community if someone wanted to kind of make that. And I would say we can also carve out a slot, tutorial slot that uh, that exists on Sunday. And I appreciate it's sometimes hard to attend the tutorial, but the, media, the material is durable. So the idea of us having slides we can point out. Out of, right. out of curiosity, do you, do you have like a canonical example you think of of like material that does uh, complement an existing standard that is like written in the way that you're describing? The, uh, I think uh, Nick Sullivan. Uh, He's over there. Yeah. So I steal some of his stuff. Um, so, so he has, uh, <laughs> he had a, like a really nice blog explaining the lifted curve crypto. Yeah. You know, animated GIFs. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it's not kind of a slide deck, it's just a bloggy kind of thing, but it works really well. I think that's 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 a that's what I use as an example. Great. Deirdre. Hi, I'm Deirdre. Um, echoing what Chris said earlier, uh, the ideal world is that there is a protocol and a proof and a spec of the protocol, and they're kind of moving together through analysis and specification. 
Unfortunately, this is not the ideal world. Uh, we encountered this with the specification of the threshold signature scheme FROST. We had a quite simple scheme in a paper with lovely proofs and follow-on proofs from other academics of the general scheme, which gave us assurances that the underlying ideas were sound, but when we actually turned it into a specification, we got a lot of input from a lot of people who are developing schemes in the real world, and it changed a lot not in the fundamentals of its security, but just like what it looks like when you implement it as a thing to deploy in the real world. And it would be lovely to uh, formally model that with something like Tamarin or Proverif or any of these other schemes. Unfortunately, those uh, formal tools don't support Shamir secret sharing, which is a fundamental primitive of uh, a threshold scheme. So there's this push and pull between what we would like to do ideally and what we can do and just getting something done and getting something done securely that people can implement generally securely the first time when they look at it. Um, so there's there's that of like, this is what we ideally like to do, but there's things kind of put it, pushing us in the way. Second, um, in terms of building on cryptographic primitives and sort of uh, assuming that there were security properties of the thing that turned out not to be true, uh, I understand how this can bite you in the foot uh, the things with the new post-quantum uh, chems like Kyber that are coming out are fighting us in a couple of places and the protocols are maybe like HPKE uh, saving us from ourselves, but not all of them are. Um, I, it, it's not easy to say just like, just look at the security properties these things have proofs for, aka indistinguishability, chosen ciphertext attack, because that is what the Kyber and this team were focusing on when they started changing how Kyber behaved as it turned into ML Chem. And their justification was, we are only trying to provide this particular security property and none of these other things that may have happened to also be there when we first wrote it down. And several documents and protocols have assumed that they could rely on those properties and now they can no longer do that if they want to point at the official NIST standard of MLCAM. So I, I don't like it either, but just to kind of hedge your bets and just be like, if you're trying to implement a primitive into your protocol, just be like, this thing says it provides this security property like chosen ciphertext uh, attack security. And then don't assume anything else about it, especially if it's not locked down and shipped like the sort of FIP stuff. Um, and I, I would love the formal methods group to continue to help, um, but kind of see previous statement about there are some things that the formal methods tools can do and sometimes some things that they can't and often it involves working with the main developer of the tool to like get support to model the exact thing that you need to model your protocol and yada, yada, yada. So it's like you generally have to become very, uh, social with those people to actually get something useful out of working on that. So that's it. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I, I, in my experience, the, like the, the people working on these tools are, you know, super friendly and helpful. And if you just, you know, chat with them, they're, they're willing to add things. Um, I don't know why the chuckles, they are nice. Oh, no, no, no I didn't say NIST. I, I did not say NIST. <laughs> um, Oh, yeah, I, I, I will wrap up here because Paul said so. Thank you. <laughs> Good presentation. Yeah. yeah, really, thank you so much for that talk. That level said, I, I know I'm ab absolutely happy to admit that I learned a bunch of things and how things are kind of integrated in the ecosystem. Uh, I don't know whether folks are willing to nod to say the same, but, you know, really, thank you for that, for, for that talk. Okay, so we have some time for open mic now. If folks want to talk about something, comment on something, now's the time to come to the mic. Otherwise, we're going to end the day earlier. Andy Fregley, Verison. It's a little bit of a different topic. Um, I was working with some of the leading DNSSEC researchers and we were uh, analyzing what's gonna be the impact of the adoption of post-quantum algorithms on DNSSEC. We decided a uh, thing to do would be to have a research agenda. What type of research should be done 
before we make substantial changes that impact the protocol or the operational uh, practices that people do around DNSSEC. So we wrote up a um, ID together. We submitted a couple of months ago. It's called uh, a research agenda for a post-quantum DNSSEC. It's a little bit unusual to have that type of document with the IRTF, the IETF. So there's two requests here. Um, one is, you know, how does the document really like that fit within this organizational structure? And the second request is, uh, where might we have a, a home for such a document? And I guess the third would be, do other people feel there should be similar types of documents for other protocols? So that's my comment. So, so I'll, I'll briefly comment on that. But, um, so, so the IRTF is exactly the place where to do those kind of things, right? You, you, you look at, at things at an early stage, you do your research, and then you, you basically prepare for the time when it comes that we actually have to look at like making protocol modifications and how to use those components further on. So for instance, with the NSEC, I think it's a good example because um, there isn't as, as an urgent need with DNSSEC because we're talking about relatively short-lived signatures. So we don't have to run like crazy and implement post-quantum protection before next week because you know we, we have the time to do that. We don't have this problem of um, encrypting things that are, things that are encrypted now might be decrypted 10 years from now. So, so even though we have some more time there, it is great that I, I read your draft and it's great that you put all these pointers in. We're like, okay, what are the things that we now have like, you know, maybe a couple of years of time to make sure that we can like, fit this in later on when it does become uh, a more urgent issue. Yeah. I'll just make one comment about the, the timeline. So, in our analysis, if you should read this draft, you'll see it's it's not a little bit of research to really make uh, to really understand the impact of the different possible paths for this. It's it's years of research, and uh, and the, my my concern is that um, things get uh, my experience uh, things get adopted or get into work groups, they get a momentum behind them, and sometimes things and changes are made. Um, before adequate consideration has been done to the impact and alternatives. So that's, that's all this is basically about. Have we done our homework? And, and the second point is on the urgency front. Um, yes, we, we have the uh, National Security Agency in the US is specifying the switch over to post-quantum fully by 2035. In the US, that means that pretty much, well, everybody's gonna to go to post-quantum probably by 2035 unless they s switch that schedule just because of the momentum of that. So if you start considering the transition time for a protocol like DNSSEC being 15, so, 20 so, years, that, that's, that's so, it, so it, I, there I, is I some agree. urgency. So I agree that those are important points, but like for specifically for DNSSEC, actually the, the, the most problems with DNSSEC we have will not be the specifics of the post-quantum algorithm and whether they are good or bad, but can we actually still jury this into the protocol in some weird ways without having all these kinds of transport issues and, and UDP fragments and exactly. TCP fallbacks and, and or maybe we're just all on quick and it doesn't matter anymore. So there is, there's a lot of movement in the DNS <laughs> space that will happen in the next 10 years that are much more affecting the DNSSEC protocol than the post-quantum well, algorithm. Well, that's a perfect example, the quick example. So. Uh... My look at MAP RG and other research studies of the ecosystem its ability to adopt to new transports. Again, it needs to be studied because just saying we'll go to a new transport, well, that might take 20 years, you know. And I know it sounds easy. Yeah, we'll just do TCP or TL. No, it's not that simple. So, 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 so again, I agree with your work. I, I loved reading the draft. It, it, it made me think about what we need to do. So it was really good work, and I please continue this work. But I think right now the IRTF is actually an excellent location for that work. All right. Okay. So where in the IRTF? I would relegate that to the IRTF people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Paul? Paul Hoffman. Um, I want to follow up on what Deirdre had said um, before, because I think many I think many security working groups are about to hit the same thing she talked about, which is we thought we could use these post-quantum algorithms for these things, 
and now we can use it for the smaller set and we have to look whether we crossed over and things like that. Um, as I, I'm making a request, in your working groups, as you are discovering those things or as you're having those questions, feel free to bring those questions to PQIP. Um, because if you're having the question, there's a you know, non-zero chance that some other working group is as well. Um, this might turn into a draft in PQIP or whatever of, of covering this, but PQIP is there for, on, only on post-quantum algorithms, but is there for discussion so people discover what other people are discovering. So like I say, if, if you know, you're saying, oh, we thought this would work, but this doesn't, that's a perfectly valid thing to bring to PQIP so other people can notice it as well. Thanks. Philip? So um, one of the things that's really hit me this time is that it looks like formal methods have finally broken out after, what, me doing them for 30 years now? No. <laughs> um, it strikes me that, uh, A, some of my college tutors' warnings about yeah, formal methods can be very powerful and can lead you down the wrong hole, uh, apply. But also, as we start to look at applying them to existing protocols, we're going to find questions like, um, we, we're going to want to rebuild some of our old protocols to make the proofs clear, cleaner. Because that's actually one of the biggest uses of uh, formal methods. Once you get into modeling stuff, you start to look at things like, oh, nonce reuse uh, vulnerabilities are bad. They cause Tamarin to have so many more states that it has to uh, consider. And so I think that we may want to go back and revisit some of the path dependencies we've got into over the past few years and be willing to look at things like OCB and... Um, algorithms which don't have those uh, vulnerabilities um, because yeah, it may be a small thing now to have your model uh, resolve in two hours instead of two days but when you then take that model and build it something else on top and something else on top things get exponential so you know we basically got a new um, metric for looking at algorithms, and it's how long does it take your security proof to uh, validate? Yep, thanks for that feedback. I think doing having that conversation in the specifics is, would be the way ahead. Chris, you're in the mic. Um, yeah, so uh, in the CFRG, one of the things that they do is uh, really try to emphasize reference code to accompany implementations. Um, Reference code is quite useful. It's used to generate test vectors, used to generate testing, whatever. Um, and we just heard a talk actually uh, in the session before this on um, some researchers who went out and like tried to model AADs, uh, some encryption algorithms, uh, and the various like ways that they can break and see how it affects protocols that are using these AADs. Um, and uh, I wondered uh, while he was talking, you know, whether or not we should have like reference. Um, like models for the things that we're also specifying. So for example, if you're specifying um, a blind signature uh, protocol like blind RSA or whatever, should you have like a, um, a, a reference model that like others could take and plug into their higher level protocol that, are, that is using that? Because um, this is not the first time I've seen people model an AAD. It's, I, I've seen other people in lots of different places re-implement models for TLS, um, sometimes getting it wrong. Um, and I wonder, uh, if uh, it would be a useful artifact or useful, uh, you know, output of the specification process to not only emphasize like, you know, the, 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 the reference implementation, the running code itself, but also sort of the, you know, this part of the proof that goes along with it. I, I don't know what people think about that. I think that's a good idea. I don't know what the shape of keep having that durability would look like. I, I think we should 
could kind of talk with the IOTF group, kind of focus on that to figure out whether that's an IANA conversation or you know, something else kind of conversation. I don't know. I was just thinking like in the repos where there's already reference code, just plop in a Tamron ah, file, pro okay. file or whatever, right? Like, that, um, that, that makes sense. I, I, there, there's been a long running conversations with uh, a bunch of documents recently on Yang and rethinking what gets kept in kind of in a Yana. So uh, that's where my head went in terms of- No, uh, no, repos. not that. Um. <laughs> well, sorry. <laughs> No, because Tamarin and Proverif are like the canonical tools that people use to model things. Like, let's use the tools that exist. Yeah, I, I wasn't suggesting Yang. What I was suggesting is that there's been some creativity in using the IANA registries to keep files. Uh, yeah. All right, Russ. Yeah, so uh, building on what uh, was just said there, uh, during the lunch session of the RSWG, we were trying to figure out, does everything actually go in? Does everything have to go in the RFC? And the answer was no. For example, Yang catalog, right? The Yang module goes over there. Not, and the new SID files. And SIG files are going away. No, no, right. not SIG files, SID files. Ah, right. And so maybe some artifact can be kept in, in another place so that when the next guy comes along or you know, a better tool is developed for doing these proofs, you don't start the model all over again. Um, I don't know what that looks like, but maybe it's a model catalog or something. Yeah, good point. I hadn't considered the, the RSWG. That's even more flexibility. I, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. We can continue talking about that. Okay, uh, I'm going to say if you have not yet, for those that want to come to the mic, please come to the mic. But before that, I will plug in. I am sorry those of you sitting in the back are kind of standing. Uh, I would love to fix that in Brisbane. So if you have not clicked on the QR code in Meet Echo, please do that so we can size the room kind of correctly because I can't promise that Paul and I will remember to check the room size when the when the schedule kind of comes. So Yes. Yeah. Yes, it, it counts you. So if you have something to say, please come to the mic. Otherwise, we are going to finish a couple minutes early. And we hope you enjoy not your half day, but your full day tomorrow. <laughs> All right, we're going to call it. Thanks so much. Have a full day tomorrow. Thanks for the opportunity to present. Oh. Thank you to both of you. That was a great talk. Yeah, okay. I, I thought that was very, I mean, I learned a lot. I mean, it's very informative the way you connected to other working groups and got a real world stuff. That was super. And I, I think the